called to order the regular meeting of the Rapman County Planning Commission for Wednesday, August 18th. Did they move the crowd? We will not be, uh, this will, should not be a, a heavy lift tonight. So um, if, uh, I just want to note that Brian Shulin and Gary Light are both uh, away dropping their children off at college, which is a darn good reason to be away. But we do have a quorum and so we'll proceed. Um, Pledge allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> before we move to adopt the agenda, uh, Mr. Connick is in the audience, and this relates to the um, our preliminary review at our last regular monthly meeting, and it was a rezoning request number 21-07-01, Mountainside Properties of Virginia, request amend proffers for tax map 28-48B, 49, and 52. And Mr. Connick um, wanted, well, I thought it would be helpful if you told us where this all stands okay. currently. The first thing I want to do is apologize for the commission for the oversight that Mr. Henry pointed out. I was trying to recite the history of the different proffers on the property last month or not, but ownership is not Oh, but you did miss one owner. Uh, I did. I, I Who was that? What? Who was the owner you missed? The, the uh, CD for okay. rejuvenation. I'm trying to do the history of the property. Okay. Anyway, uh, the status of it is, as uh, I guess some, one or maybe all know, but uh, um, based on the discussion last month, uh, it was referred to the county attorney <coughs> for the, uh, to resolve the issue of whether or not the portion of the tract that's in the commercial overlay district that's defined in the comp plan uh, is or isn't subject to the proffers, whether they, as Mr. Kearney suggested, the, um, the, uh, the fact that it's included in the overlay di district overrode the proffers since it was done after the proffers were, were, were submitted. So <clears throat> Mr. Bob rendered an opinion, uh, I think, uh, late last week, Friday or Monday or something like that, anyways, and he confirmed what Mr. Curry thought. And uh, uh, so she doesn't really need to amend the proffers because as to the part of the property where the building is located, the proffers have been overridden by operation of law, I guess you'd say. And so therefore, uh, she doesn't need any approval to do the uses that are forbidden by right in the building itself. As to the other part of the possible future, outdoor, theater, dance, the, you know, performance <coughs> area. Since uh, it's not going to do that right at the present anyway, uh, we, she decided, and I, I just got a formal letter really from, just all I saw was a copy of Mr. Gossler, and that was addressed to the county staff. So I got a letter from the zoning administrator pretty much telling us what, uh, what Mr. Goss said and confirming that, so she's going to withdraw the application at this time and without prejudice obviously to bring in the other part of it in some future time okay. if circumstances so just, you know. great good summary um so uh, i would entertain a motion to adopt yeah adopt the agenda but but first striking under old business uh, item number one and moving two and three up to positions one and two under old business i'll move with all those little movements okay that's mr sharp uh, yeah. And Mr. Kohler, any further discussion? I just have one question on, on that opinion. I don't have any problem with the motion. But uh, so does that mean that all the proffers are extinguished in in toto and whole? <clears throat> no, they continue to run with the parcels uh, because there are portions of those parcels that are located outside of the general commercial overlay district. So, and, but any any use inside the general commercial, the, the overlay district, are they extinguished or are they still in force? I guess they they run in parallel, but the the general commercial overlay district is more lenient. So you can, in terms of what uses can be put in place, however more stringent uh, with regard to the use limitations and design guidelines. So there's a bit of a trade-off. You have to refer to one seventy forty five point one. You really? Yeah. I, uh, thank you. Okay. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Um, so that's a motion and a second from Mr. Sharp and Kohler to amend the agenda to strike old business number one. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thanks. Um, thank you to Marlena Lee for the very, very detailed um, meeting minutes. And I want to thank Miss Ishi for taking the time to proofread them. And um, we are we have before us minutes for our June June 16th uh, meeting and then our July 21st meeting and um, I do I reviewed these edits and none are substantive um, just some rewording and some typographic errors and if you take my word for that I would entertain a motion to adopt um, with Miss Issy's edits the July I'm sorry the June 16th and July 21st minutes. So I got a question. Sure. So, for the record, uh, Marlena does the minutes. Right. And, and before they hit us as a group to review, they're reviewed by Ms. Vichy and you and Justin. We all can review them. We all review. We all have the right to review them and make any edits that mm. we wish to review. So, but when you read, you know, you, you get. So the, what I read online today is was that the edit ones? No. No. So that's that's the original version that's posted in advance of our meeting. That's a draft, and then yeah. and so that's why we're we're taking edits and we're adopting them during the meeting in the public view. Okay. So that's the process. But anybody's welcome to edit them. Um, and frankly, um, I spend a huge amount of time on board of supervisors meeting minutes, typically, and um, and try to get those edits in in a timely fashion. So everyone's aware of them. All right. Can I just in, interject in there? I, I um, did, yeah, I think that's a fair point, and uh, I'm happy to submit any kind of edits in any way anybody finds is the most uh, appropriate way to do it. But I, I generally do read the minutes and just try to catch any errors. But um, anyway, just uh, I'm happy to follow whatever process is. Yeah, and I th what we've done, Mr. Curry, what's our new policy with the uh, Board of Supervisors? <laughs> Or not policy, but uh, our that's day. simply that uh, once the minutes are posted to the board docs for public consumption, they're not changed after initially posted. So yep. Okay. Anybody who looks at it knows that it's static, which may lead to additional corrections on meeting day, which is it sounds like the same thing. That the right. Does. Yeah. So, so um, Mr. Henry, what I was doing in my first months on the board of supervisors is I'd get the minutes, I'd print them out, I'd very in great detail go through and make typographic corrections. I'd provide those to Mr. Curry, but that became an issue because they were not, I was, I was editing the meeting minutes sort of just by providing the county administrator the edits. So the new process is anything that we correct after they're posted is done in public view. And I'm not sure of the planning commission, but the draft minutes are sent to the board of supervisors in advance of them being posted right. to the agenda to allow feedback before they're posted if there's something that's way off. Way off, but right. little stuff typically is done in a meeting now. <clears throat> so are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay. And I wouldn't, just so you know, if I'm getting uh, edits from one member of the planning commission, I'm not just automatically accepting them. I typically go back and look at the media and make sure that they're not changing the substance of the minutes and what they reflect. Okay, um, Mr. Kohler made the motion. We don't have a second yet. I forgot what we were. We're doing. simply to adopt the okay. adopt the the two, two sets of minutes with uh, these minor corrections. Well, I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. And I'll I'll just give these to Marlena. Uh, there might be one. There's, yeah. So she double posted the June 16th. Okay. And so that's July 21st. Much. Sure. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, I, I don't, but I'm not, I'm not trying to sneak in any edits. No. I, I, I really do want to make sure everybody's comfortable with however any edits I, I propose. No, I, I, like I said, I spent a lot of time on the Board of Supervisors minutes, and so I'm grateful for your effort and encourage everyone to provide edits if they see anything wrong. So we're just talking about typos and... Yeah. 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 Incomplete sentences or run-on sentences, but it, not substantive changes. Okay, so um, with that, I'll go ahead and open the 
public comment period. Anyone wish to speak? Okay, that's exciting. Good evening again. David Connick from Stonewall District. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the commission, I just wanted to note that it's a year since we had our public hearing on the comprehensive plan. Uh, which uh, was recommended for approval by, as I recollect, a uh, majority vote of six to one. And <clears throat> uh, one of the elements of the comp plan that we probably spent four or five months on was the issue of maps of the villages. And uh, as everybody, except perhaps Alex and I'm sure Mr. Whitson, I'm sure is aware of it, um, the, you know, we had a lot of iterations of the maps. We went back and forth and sometimes back and then <laughs> forth again. And finally, we came up with a set of maps that, as I recollect, was approved by a majority vote of five to two. And that was part of the plan that was ultimately recommended to the Board of Supervisors. And as most of you know, then uh, there was a lot of um, comment, uh, public comment and possibly private comment uh, that resulted in the maps being taken out of the comp plan when it was finally passed. And we were left with some language that's a little bit better than what was in there before. But basically, it's kind of vague and imprecise uh, language in terms of defining the areas of future growth and development in and around the villages. And uh, this is something that's a topic sort of near and dear to my heart because I was a, a, an advocate of putting maps in the comp plan long before I got on the planning commission and uh, I, I was very happy that we managed to get it get the ball over the finish line only to have our have our touchdown nullified I guess you'd say in any event uh, I understand and appreciate some of the concerns uh, that people expressed about those particular maps and uh, I would be the first one to agree they were sort of a compromise and they didn't reflect everybody's exact views of what they ought to be. Uh, and uh, so I'm not being critical of the board or anybody like that that for taking it out, but it's been a year now. And I remember Mr. Kohler saying a couple of years ago that, well, the comp plan's a kind of an iterative process and we don't have to wait five years and so forth. We can keep up amending it as time goes by. And I note that a year has gone by and, uh, and probably eight or nine months since the supervisors saw fit to remove the maps, but there hasn't been any further discussion of it. Uh, what, where, what the map should be, should look like, shouldn't look like, how you want to go about the process of defining it. Um, and I do also want to note again that the, uh, the uh, what's that group called? The... Uh, Appendix no, the, uh, no the, the, the consultant group. I can't ever think of their name. Berkeley. Berkeley group. Berkeley group. That was one of their critiques of, of, of the draft mm -hmm. ordinance at the time that didn't have any maps. And I'm very pleased that the commission's looking at the solar issue. You've looked at Falkier's ordinance. You've looked at some others. I know I sent you, I think, Madison's. But Culpepper, I don't know if you've looked at it, but if you look at all the maps, or I mean, sorry, all the comp plans of, from Albemarle, everywhere, we're about the only county that doesn't have maps in our comp plan. I mean, maps defining the areas of growth. Yeah. And, uh, and so I just want, that's my comment. I wish the commission would find some time and revisit that subject. And however you do it, whatever process you use uh, that, to come up with some maps, I think it would really be a service to the county. You know, the, uh, as you all know, we had a very contentious rezoning application recently. And as I said to the Board of Supervisors, I didn't have to say it to the Planning Commission because, uh, because you already knew. If there had been maps, it would have kind of been a slam dunk way decision, pretty much, because the, the parcel in question either would or would not have been within the zone or the area that's designated in the comp plan, and that would be pretty well dispositive of the issue. And there's, I'm sure, going to be future rezoning requests and future issues of the same kind. So I hope that you'll do that sometime soon. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to make those comments. Anyone else? I saw Miss Van Huss on the stairwell. I don't know if she was. She, it looks like she left. Okay. Um, I think we've exhausted the public unless you have any comments to make. No. 
your press. So, okay, great. I'll close the public comment period. Um, so really we're continuing this uh, informal discussion tonight that we began at our last work session on, um, well, actually it was before our last work session, we had started talking about how to clean up all the, the quote unquote events language in the zoning ordinance. And then separately we had tasked um, the county attorney with putting together um, a sign ordinance that we could dive into. And Mr. Curry, you wanna just bring us up to date on where we stand with those. And then you were kind enough to prepare some materials for tonight. And I know we are short staffed tonight. So thanks for all you've done. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Goff and I uh, met last week. We did a bit of a tour and uh, discussed his progress to date on draft sign ordinance. Uh, unfortunately, he's been pulled in multiple directions and special counsel in different localities. Thought he'd be able to have something ready for you for this meeting, but he was unable to do that. Um, he is following um, the model that was shared with the commission that is used by Albemarle County and attempting to make it as simple as possible uh, and uh, identifying through matrix the types of signs and then the, um, the restrictions on those signs, whether it be height or distance from the road or area or number, uh, all in one spot for each uh, set of zoning classifications, whether it be residential or resource preservation or commercial industrial. Um, the idea is that we can populate a draft matrix for the planning commission, and then the planning commission can come in and review that and adjust numbers and sizes and whatnot. We'll try to get it close to what the majority, what the current ordinance allows, and then uh, you can shape it from there. Uh, as you know, it the whole intent of this is to take that uh, content uh, out of the yep. document and make it content neutral. So I would expect that it will be available for you at your next meeting. And if we have something before then, uh, we can make it available and then uh, Chair, you can potentially call a meeting. And, and in, order to call a, in order to call a meeting, just to expedite our work, how much? Uh, five days unless it's identified during the preceding meeting and okay. because you wouldn't know when it's going to be. It'll have to be five days notice to the rest of the commissioners okay. and regular FOIA notice. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd really like to get that <clears> as, <throat> to get to that as soon as possible. I meant to bring it in. It's in the back of my other car, but um, I was out on business 211 on the, I guess it'd be the west end of town. And there was another one of those stake signs, you know, the ones that people pop in. And this time it was for somebody um, who was like gravestones.com or something. And I'm thinking, I mean, really, are we going to have to? Continue looking at all these fast internet. Most of those can be dealt with uh, with VDOT because okay. they don't allow them in the right of way. Okay. Um, and then if they're out of the right of way, you can probably deal with them with the property owner who may not know that they're there. Yeah, nobody ever seems to deal with them, and they sit there forever. And I'm just curious if it, where, where where you think we'll end up on that kind of thing because I think well, that's a legislative decision. <laughs> I know, but <laughs> and temporary signs is the hardest part of the that's entire what I ordinance, thought. and. Uh, you, of course, you want to accommodate temporary signs. You have to accommodate certain types of temporary signs that are popping up all over the place right now. Yeah. Uh, and the state law would require us to um, have no more, basically the same rules for political signs as we do for other temporary signs. So um, you can't just prohibit them. Uh, I think you probably could, but I don't think it'd be wise because they're going to happen anyway. Um, and you don't want to stand in the way of free speech when it comes to elections. So uh, the commission is going to have to think about size and number that you want to enforce. And, okay. and this reset on the side ordinance really should be reviewed or considered by the commission and ultimately the board and citizens who speak at a public hearing. These are the items that you want and clearly want staff to enforce. Yeah. And don't put it in the ordinance if you don't want somebody yeah. getting a letter saying you're not allowed to do it. VDOT used to pick up signs in the right of way yeah. every couple, maybe three times a year, two or three times a year. And then they would store them for a while. And when you come get them, they were gone. We can coordinate with them. Um, <coughs> we know people in VDOT. We can coordinate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, I mean, to me, it's just really, for this beautiful county, it's just really a sad thing to see all those. And 
it's getting worse and worse. And especially now that so many businesses are internet based. I mean, people, I don't even know where these, a lot of these companies are actually based. I think they just hire brokers who run around. And, they may. And the other area is the, um, the wind animated sign. Right. Uh, whether it's a feather sign or just a flag in somebody in front of somebody's business is open, which we not really focus on what words are on that. Yeah. Uh, but it really seems Art and I will deliver to you an ordinance that allows someone to put a flag in front of their business. Um, now, if you want to take it out, it'll be up to you, know, you and the board of supervisors. Mm-hmm. But it really seems, uh, it, you know, it's, it's overbearing for the zoning administrator to tell somebody they can't put an open sign out. Right. Uh, but if that's what we want as a community and the public speaks to that, that may be what you end up with. It'll just lead to a lot of enforcement. Okay. Well, I'll be in touch with you, and if we can, if we can schedule a meeting before our next meeting, I would prefer that, um, not to burden the other members of the planning commission. But we just got to move these things along. So. Okay. So that's on. That's for signs. Any any questions on the sign front? Okay. Let's move on to um, events and. Mr. Curry was kind enough to pull together some pretty useful examples from <clears throat> Goochland and um, Warren, Albemarle, Frederick, and, and his favorite county, Gloucester. Did I pronounce that correctly, sir? Close oh, enough. Okay. Um, so why don't you why don't you just give us a framework here, and I know, and then I should also say that. Um, for our last meeting, when we discussed this, uh, Mr. Curry had prepared an extract from our own zoning ordinance just to show all of the places where kind of events-related language pops up and gives us a chance to see where it might contradict or language might contradict other language or be sort of untenable in terms of enforcement. Right. So I, when, when uh, we talked about this at the last meeting, we talked about my goal of having a clear continuum of uh, events, whether they be in a structure or not in a structure, or a purpose-driven structure or just a field, um, that would range from next to no impact on the community and neighbors to potentially a lot of impact on neighbors yeah. in the community. And that the permitting process, I envision the permitting process could be commiserate with that impact. And so if there's a very little impact likely because there's a very few people would go, then, you know, probably don't have to put somebody through multiple public hearings. Mm -hmm. Uh, But on the other end of the spectrum, if someone wants to have uh, an event every week for 10,000 people, either you should have an ordinance that prohibits it because that's not what we want here or have a very onerous process because that's going to be a real big deal and everything in between. And so, um, the commission will have to think about what categories may make sense. So with that in mind, <clears throat> I looked out uh, to some of the other localities. Uh, our code publisher allows me to do a multi-code search. That's great. Uh, so anybody who has uh, the ECO 360 product, I can search across all those codes. Mm-hmm. And I just restricted it to Virginia and identified uh, several um, localities that had different event facility, event venue, events, special events, uh, just trying to search on different terms and pulled a few. And then there were some that I knew in the uh, state had gone through this in a, in a tough way. Goochland is one of those, uh, and they're kind of similar to us. I mean, they're bigger than us in population, but yeah. they look at it just outside of Richmond, and they have um, – really a protective zoning ordinance for half the county and the other half is allowed to grow a little bit more. Uh, Interestingly, they've uh, permitted um, events outside the zoning ordinance through Mm -hmm. business side of things. So I I thought that was interesting, but theirs is the most extensive ordinance and may have some ideas that that we may want to incorporate. I would recommend that we keep things in the zoning ordinance. Uh, And then, of course, I'm familiar with Gloucester and I know what they have just gone through. Uh, so, the one at the 100,000 foot level, yep. the thing that I recognize is that we appear to make it much more complicated than everybody else as far as the various categories that you can fit in, whether you're a conference center resort or a conference 
convention center or a country inn retreat or lodge or a festival or a field party, mm -hmm. all these different things. It's not clear what you are, whereas many of the other ones just simply have one category of a event facility or a special event facility, yeah. and they and they just go around that. And um, I almost envision being able to have four things uh, and link to a facility, an actual structure. So you want to build a structure or have a structure and do events and that then that might be one type of thing, and you're doing it just in an open field would be the other category. Mm -hmm. And then for each of those categories, you have something that's de minimis in use, mm -hmm. and, and then a level above which would require that public input process. When you say de minimis, de minimis in use, would that be based on number of people or frequency of, I mean... Uh, the, you, impact on neighbors. Right, so well, how do you for measure sure. define that, yeah. and then what metrics would drive that distinction. You may not be able to come to that distinction. If you can't, then everything just has to go through the public hearing process, yeah. which is not a bad thing. No. Uh, it's just if somebody happens to um, have a, a building that's not used very much right now, and they want to be able to throw, we uh, throw weddings once a month for 25 people, mm -hmm. and it's in a commercial zone, does that require a public hearing? And maybe we think it does, but it seems to me that there's, there's probably a category of uses that would be really customary for a, a citizens and neighbors to expect. And you don't have to put somebody through a public hearing process. You can give them a greater expectation of what is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not really positioned to draw those lines, and the Planning Commission is uniquely positioned to draw those right. lines. And we will, <laughs> staff will help you try to sort it out. Or find a totally different uh, way to look at it, which is uh, one reason why uh, these examples may help you. And just run through uh, Gloucester, Frederick County, Albemarle County, Warren County, and Goochland County. And if you find anything else across the state, we can pull that information as well. Um, is this um, so? The Gloucester example is this the extent of it? Yeah, just a one pager. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and so what I did is I oh, went I through their ordinances and tried to pull the sections that would be pertinent. Uh, many, uh, for example, in Gloucester, you just can't have a conference center. Not a youth provided for, you can't do it, period. Okay. Now you can have an event facility, but you can't have like a resort. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if somebody came to the door with a resort, then it may go through a ordinance amendment followed by you know some conditional use permit or something they may reinvent the wheel at that time if it looked very profitable for them or something and I I wonder if our community really needs to be seeking out additional resorts uh, you know, do, or do we want a, a Marriott type resort somewhere in the rural preservation district where there isn't one right now uh, you don't have to allow it uh, anything that's already in existence would now that we really have any resorts, uh, would be uh, vested. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to invite future development in the rural uh, preservation district. We know we've had some issues with country in or conference center, yeah. which is really the same use, just more or less uh, threshold for people. Uh, you don't have to allow future ones, but you can. Uh, I don't know how to, to best facilitate further discussion. I yeah. know I just dropped these examples on you uh, today, uh, but I'm willing to work with you any way you, you'd like to this evening to try to move it a little bit further and yeah, provide some I'd guidance like to do on that. Uh, something that staff can work on before your next meeting. Anyone want to jump in in terms of general thoughts on how, we, how you want to approach this? I just very general thoughts. I just start throwing stuff out. First of all, um, thanks, uh, Gary, for um, just working on the sign language. That's helpful to know that you know we're going to see a draft that we can really work from. And I know that's taken a lot of time and effort, but thank you. And same on this um, to have a little bit of information to kind of uh, talk through and think about helps helps define it a little bit. Um, uh, so I like your. Um, your idea and, you know, is, is a thought of, of having certain small events that are 
that, that don't probably small events for certain types of facilities maybe that don't per, that don't require a public hearing or a permit. Um, but I think we also need to do a couple other things with the ordinance side. There's 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 an over, there's a lot of confusing overlap. Um, I think as some of the things you pointed out show. Uh, and there's a, there, it doesn't seem to have been thought through. It seems to have been more kind of thrown together. But uh, in terms of um, events in general, um, you know, we've had people come in wanting big weddings, you know, once a, once a month um, as a, on, their big, on their big parcels. Um, and certainly events can be a way to help big parcel owners, you know, make a little extra income, and that's a good thing. Um, but then we get down to the, the micro level of tourist homes, for example, and, and what do we allow? So I, those aren't very concrete or helpful thoughts, but I just know that events are definitely a way that, um, that landowners can make a little extra income, but how, how much is too much? So anyway, that's very general. Gary, if you were, I'm just, I'm still looking at Gloucester's. If you were to distill how this works from a practical perspective. I think this goes to your earlier point about sort of two, it's going down two paths effectively. So if you took Gloucester as a county and anybody, and then think about the types of requests we get around here, I mean, how does this, how does this work? I mean, you said there are no resorts, for example, it's not even entertained, but what's, I mean, it seems so simple. Um, I just wonder if something pithy like this might work for us if we just made it super, super easy from a minimum. I mean, obviously there's no minimum acreage stuff in here. Um, I'm curious about that as well. Um, but if we, if we came up with minimum acreage for types of events in certain zoning districts, could we accomplish all of this with something really short and sweet? Of course you could. Um, finding what you can do and what's appropriate for the community is, is the difficult part. Yeah. I would think here um, transportation is always a key. And so how do you get access to, to the parcel where uh, the event's going to take place? Is mm -hmm. it, and a lot you'll see this through a lot of these. Is it direct access off of a, a public state highway? Uh, and if it's not, it's either prohibited or you need to get uh, show that your east deed of easement allows the use for that sort of purpose, or you need to have those other owners identify that you know, they allow you to use it for that purpose. And even if in that case, uh, as the commission and board just recently did in 17066K for tourist zones, you decided that um, in order to have a tourist home, you would have to at least be off of a a road that meets the type two road mm -hmm. standards in your subdivision ordinance, which isn't too onerous. I mean, it, mm -hmm. but it's at least the standard. And if you if you can't meet that, you either have to upgrade your road, or you can't apply, yeah. or you can you can apply and just get denied. Right. Which um, is so those sort of standards for transportation, I think, would be pretty big. And the shared accesses we've seen here since I've been here <laughs> have been the most problematic. Yep. Without a doubt, when you're trying to have this commercial use coexist with a residential use on a private drive, um, that's been the worst case scenario. Um, if acreage is, I think, helpful, but I don't think acreage is as helpful without a, um, a setback included. Okay. Because uh, you can have a thousand acres and have it right up against the neighbor. And yeah, that thousand acres doesn't do anything to mm -hmm. that neighbor. So I think those need to go hand in hand. And if it's a small event, then, uh, you know, and you include something like no, uh, no amplified music or something like that uh, ever or during certain periods of time or outside, um, then a small event near a neighbor occasionally is probably not that big of a deal. Uh, but if it's going to be a thousand people, there's no quiet event. <laughs> and if it's allowed to be 50 feet from the property line, and the neighbor's house is another 50 feet away from that sideline. That's that's a pretty big impact. And I, I wouldn't want that next to my house very often. Right. Uh, and then you need to decide 
most any of us as an accessory use could invite our friends and family over for our family reunion on our property anytime we want. It's not a commercial enterprise. Mm -hmm. And some of us have really big families. Uh, and so this, the, you know, this um, switch over to a commercial event is, is a big difference. And do you want to handle nonprofits any different? And that was something the Board of Supervisors looked at and wanted to kick down as, as you looked at this. Should nonprofits be looked at differently? We had Eldon host a couple events out there yeah. for nonprofits. They were, you had to pay to get in, but it was a nonprofit. Does for it, for does me, it make the, any difference to, from an impact to the community, and should it make a difference in how you permit one? For me, the issue there, I think what I recall was that it wasn't really about a nonprofit organization, it was about who should be who should be requesting the permit to have an event. And I think what threw me off there was the, the requester had no connection at all to the property. Yeah. And, and you, you're, um, you're basically hosting or sponsoring. Yeah. 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 And I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's a fix, a potential fix, but it seems like the property owner ought to be the one who's on the hook, um, for the permit because they're the ones who will continue on the property on which something bad might happen. I think it would be not very difficult to write that yeah. into it. I think to me that resolves that. I, I don't know that the profit status of who's causing 10,000 people to show up really matters. It, right. I mean, to me, it's the parcel, what's their road access, like you suggested, and not who's coming in and seeking the permit. And once you get more people, then you need to get into the health and safety matters. So yeah. can you get the people in and out safely? Do Does the applicant need to provide... Um, some sort of law enforcement for entry and exit and pay for that. Um, do they need to stage uh, EMS or rescue if you're getting real big? Yeah. And most of these you'll see don't get into the nitty gritty details of you need to have X number of porta potties or whatever. They just say you need to meet BDH requirements. And, and so you don't want to invite a thousand people to your field if you have nowhere for them to use the bathroom. So. They need to prepare a plan and provide it to you, to the planning commission and board, explain to you why it is acceptable and would meet health department requirements, and then it would be, in our ordinance, probably a special exception or a special use permit, and the bodies would have to judge whether it's appropriate or not, and BDH would have to be on the hook to say that it does or doesn't meet the requirements. So under under this Gloucester, Gloucester one, um, number five, that's kind of what you're talking about, I think number five with subsections A through I, that it seems like that would pertain to some kind of big event. Is that correct? But it's a sliding scale, so we could, if it's a small event, then these are easy boxes to check. Mm -hmm. But it all still, it all, all of this is premised on the notion that somebody is coming in for a multi-body review. Right. And some kind of sp conditional use permit. Yes. Okay. But it seems like we just administratively, bureaucratically, we wouldn't want to be reviewing every single, I don't think we'd be wanting to review. like. Well, so that's where, uh, and Gloucester doesn't do this, but in your definition, you might be able to set apart certain types of events, like uh, it was just done with the renewable energy. You have a small category mm -hmm. and a utility category. That's what I was thinking. The small category may be permitted by right with a P in the use table, and and the, uh, the large or uh, unconditioned would be through a special exception. Mm -hmm. And that definition would drive where that cutoff is, if there are certain clear metrics of what that would be, whether it be number of people attending or... Um, size of parcel or something like that. Okay. Um, the other thing in Gloucester that I see, it's interesting, and I'll shut up. I want to hear what other people think. It says, num number two, event facilities can be a principal or accessory use. Event facilities in a residential or agricultural district that are accessory to the site's principal use shall not substantially change the character of the primary use of the property. Right. So I think that's the... Uh, uh, the farmer uh, wants to start throwing festivals on his property, and all of a sudden, this is no longer an agricultural farm use. This is okay. a, a, this is an event use that happens to have a barn. Okay. Um, 
I don't know how practical it is to actually try to I know, that's what I mean. enforce some of that, but you, you can express the, legi uh, the legislative intent, and then when you're going through the review process for public hearings and deciding on the impact, the body may be able to lean on that and say, look, you know, you're taking a 100-acre parcel that is in farming, and now you're saying 98 acres is going to be for your events, and you're going to have two acres of farming. That doesn't meet number two, mm -hmm. and we're not going to approve it. And then the other one that jumped out at me, and then I really will stop, um, in the Warren County Zoning Ordinance, um, it drew my attention because it actually, the, there's a minimum acreage clause in here, but then I read it and I thought, gosh, this seems like a wide open invitation for anybody, in this case, with more than 20 acres, to do whatever they want, whenever they want. That's the, the definite, I guess it's part of the definitions a rural events facility. So maybe it's just a definition. It's not. It's a definition. Oh, okay. and, uh, oh I, I see. I believe more. it is a special exception or CUP. Okay. Um, but then you know, if you have 19 acres, I guess you're out. And if you're over 20, then you can do all these. And they get into, well, what is one of these things? And you see weddings listed and various other and this and similar events and activities as determined by the zoning administrator. Who's ultimately required, responsible to uh, interpret the ordinance? Many times, uses come in that don't exactly line up, and the zoning administrator is making that determination. That's identified elsewhere. In your so, is it a stretch to say that if you take the Rapan County definitions, which span everything from conference center, resort, convention, conference, convention center, country and retreat, or lodge, festival, and field party, if you aggregated or consolidated all of those? Could you make the leap that Warren County just covers it under one definition? Is that the gist of it, or am I oversimplifying? I think generally, uh, the one thing you'll note, and I didn't include in some of these, is where they can be um, applied. And you'll see that it is only in a couple zoning districts. And I'm not familiar with all their zoning districts. Uh, it's just not allowed in a commercial area. Yeah. They may find a different way to fit it into those commercial areas. Well, one county, uh, it, it simply developed completely different mm -hmm. than we did from 1960 forward. Yeah. You drive through the county and, and you get off the, the main road and you run into restaurants, campgrounds, um, you got the river resorts with timeshares were, were sold. Uh, you got all type of different hybrid uses going on out in their areas and it's kind of you know it's it's, it's kind of everything's gotten out of the bottle and it's, it's hard for them i think to to put everything back in in an orderly fashion yeah and that's a, a huge benefit for rapahannock county is if in, in a large way that gene isn't out mm -hmm. but once <laughs> once it's can't unring the bell yeah i think i think where we have to think about is, is the whole spectrum of, of, of size properties that we have and what would be acceptable, uh, you know, you, you, whether you call it a conference center or you call it a, uh, it, you know, you take a large property and, and you put some facilities on there uh, for meetings and you put facilities on there for horses and where you know, 20 people could go for a week. Well, you know, is, is that good or bad? You know, you go out west, and there are every place out west. Uh, and, you know, the Marriott Ranch itself, uh, over in Hume, you know, that's that's a very attractive property. And, and they bring people in there to, to stay, and, and they got horseback riding. And, and I think it's one of the prettier real properties real property areas of Faulkner County and is, is that and then you look at in, in Rappahannock you got what Mazelle did down in Castleton and the facilities that he has down there that I don't think they can use that much is, is are, are they incorrect now well I don't know how I mean, that sure. was permitted but people I mean, in the room may I mean uh, but I mean yeah, we've lived with that for 20 years and seen the impact there. And, and I think the community 
best I can tell, largely rallied around the opportunity to go mm -hmm. get culture. Uh, it's a very peculiar location, certainly not right off a primary highway or anything, um, but it seems to work. Um, I mean, and then you look down in some parts of Virginia, you know, particularly down south, and you look at, for example, Primland down, right. you yeah. know, down in southern Virginia, you know, and that started out as a shooting reserve, and now that's kind of a giant, giant golf course. That if something like that happened on a couple thousand acres, what, what, is, is that bad? Is that a bad way to keep a big property together and keep it? Cynic or yeah, and, and that may depend on uh, how much buffer and what type of buffer is between it and residential uses. Yeah, uh, what kind of access they have to a primary highway? Uh, if they have good access to a primary highway and have very good buffers, um, it's largely out of sight, out of mind. Now there are going to be potential impacts for law enforcement and public safety, and you need to think about those if you're going to invite more people to the community from outside and we need to be able to protect them when they're here and when they have their heart attack just statistically we need to be able to get in there and get them yeah. so if it's 10,000 people the statistics would suggest there's going to be more than if it's 100 people uh, uh, but you can work that in and so you need to provide uh, you know public safety or emergency medical support for events over x number of people and i'm thinking about uh the vineyard down there, um, down there on 211, uh, Amosville, I mean, they, they have the, the big room in there where they can have events. And they Is it uh, Normandy? Yeah. And I think they got a special exception yeah. for events yeah. or something so, like that. Yeah, what I, mean, is I think they can have 100, 150 people. It's a very large facility there. And that really hasn't caused any problems with, with the neighbors. Yeah. You've got... Uh, Direct access to 211. Yeah. And uh, you've got the, uh, I call it Windsor Lodge, it has a different name now over at Huntley, uh, where the chef, uh, oh, yeah. Glenn Gordon. Yeah, Glenn Gordon there. You got that property, and that's a, quite a large building, and, and he does basically meals only. I think they have some overnight lodging going on. Yeah, they have overnight lodging. Yeah, right? they got that going on now. And that hasn't. Yeah, I think they're a country inn. Yeah, um, it's very and unusual. again another direct access to a primary yeah. habitat. Yeah. yeah, so that I mean, so there are things in the county that are different. Those are all good examples. Yeah. So, and, but I think each of those um, the farm, the winery is a tough one because of the Code of Virginia. But when you get into events, each of those are examples of uses that probably should have a public hearing, allow the neighbors to. Uh, you know, explain why it is or isn't a, a good use and allow the planning commission and the board to consider whether particular uh, reasonable conditions should be placed on the on the use, whether it's for noise or, or whatever. Um, those, I, I think, clearly would line up in that category. What's the, um, and <laughs> this is a million dollar question, I mean, what's the interplay between anything we settled on in terms of our own ordinance and state provisions on agritourism because we're seeing, I've said a ton of times, I don't mind saying it again, I feel like it's abused in the county and in some instances where we know that from a public safety standpoint, access to property is not great and um, is not is not great, it's not ideal or even close and, uh, and yet it's still happening because right. under some extent, well, and, and and we could uh, we could probably clean up our ordinance. It's it's not completely aligned with state code and the farm wineries as it's listed, but the state code gets to talk about those customary and incidental to a, a wine, you know farm winery. So, you know how far can people press that with events? And uh, Mr. Goff uh, has. Um, reviewed that in the past, uh, but that's still a big open question that we could probably put a tighter bow on in ordinance. That doesn't mean that somebody may not try to push back on it. At the end of the day, it's the courts who decide some of those things, and a lot of that, to my knowledge, hasn't been tested in the courts, and you know, that lobby is very strong. Yeah. So the more you know, if we egregiously push back on it, then the General Assembly gets involved. Um, 
kind of like the conversation we had last time about signs or um, uh, yeah, solar, and and then like was taken up a couple years ago, the General Assembly uh, tries to include something to say that weddings is an agricultural activity. That didn't. That was floated up and got pushed back. Right, and I mean. With all due respect to one property in my voting district, um, disc golf is an agricultural activity. I would think not. With no, no, with no bona fide agricultural activities on a property. But is, my, my privilege of not being as an administrator is I can confidently sit up here and say things without them really meaning yeah. anything legally. But um, I would think those are pretty far afield from the agricultural activity. Yeah. So, I mean, that's been my frustration because, you know, the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission, for that matter, said no. Every single person on both bodies said no to a country in, for road, in particular for road safety, access, public safety reasons. And now it's a yeah, center, so, center of activity. And that'll blow back to uh, enforcement and it could go in land in the courts. <laughs> Yeah. And at the end of the day, a, a judge, and it has to be a judge, and maybe a judge in Richmond, will make the final decision on uh, whether it's acceptable or not, or fits a definition or doesn't. Yeah. We would like to avoid that every way possible. Yeah, so I just think going forward, however we restructure this, we need to protect ourselves against that kind of workaround. Because if, if as a local government, we say, hey, we don't, we don't think that your proposed use of a property as a country in is is a suitable one for that parcel, um, and here are the reasons why. That doesn't mean well. Okay, now we're going to go. Well, I think the the big takeaway is to, to inform the work here, and both of what you've said and Mr. Henry have said is that you have plenty of examples in the community Precisely. that identify what seems to work in our yeah. community and what seems to not work in our community. And if you can pull the characteristics of each of those out, it should help you inform what, um, where you want to target these to be allowed, uh, zoning districts, yeah. and what restrictions would be in place relative to size or buffers or numbers of people or you know any of those sorts of things. Co-location with a particular use. I suppose you could just say, can't do it with a winery if, if you wanted to. I don't know why it, would necessarily matter, but you could. Well, and you taught me early on, just as I was trying to wrap my head around sort of the concept behind special exception permits, you said, look, special exception, and I, it was really useful for me to just the basic concept. Special exceptions mean that certain uses are good in some places, but not others. And that's exactly what we're Yeah, it's a matter of fact, I talking in, about here. in doing this work today, um, and actually looking through back through the Gloucester ordinance, there was a preamble to their conditional use permit, which is just another form of special exception as authorized by the Code of Virginia. They had a great two paragraphs that I clipped and sent to Michelle and Art and said, we need to think about sticking this into our 170-47-G. Do you have it? G. I pulled up the email, I guess. Yeah. Um, just go to the website. Because, yeah, I mean, Al's, Al's point about all of those properties, they just described the one common denominator, direct highway access, land buffer, um, I guess setback. I'm just trying to think what ties them all together and makes them, well, except for Castleton Festival, like Gary said, it's not exactly direct major highway access, but still, I mean. But that, there were some aspects of that that made it work, and so can yeah. you identify what those might exactly. have been? It might have been the size of the parcel. It's or the parcel size, yeah. But I agree, I mean, those are all kind of no impact, no adverse effect on anyone. Well, so like Castleton, I mean, they, they were set way back, and they had enough parcel size, and they took a lot of responsibility in terms of managing traffic and yeah. managing the whole venue well um, and I don't know that we imposed all that on them they just did it um, but it might be worth considering what they did yeah that'd, what, be, that'd be a good one to dust off and um, and also Glenn, Glenn Gordon would be another good one and I mean I haven't thought about um, Narmada in a long time but it'd be interesting to see the thinking that went into that I don't know if you could read yeah um, okay. <laughs> I'd be happy to read it aloud sure yeah yeah 
says, uh, and this is again under CP purpose, the purpose of this section is to provide for certain uses which, because of their unique characteristics or potential impacts on adjacent land uses, are not generally permitted in certain zoning districts as a matter of right, but which may, under the right set of circumstances and conditions, be acceptable in certain specific locations. Yep. These uses are permitted only through the issuance of a conditional use permit by the Board of Supervisors after ensuring that the use can be appropriately accommodated on a specific property will be in conformance with a comprehensive plan, can be constructed and operated in a manner which is compatible with the surrounding land uses and overall character of the community, and the public interest, safety, and general welfare of the citizens of the county will be protected. Then no inherent right exists to receive a conditional use permit. Such permits are, special, are a special privilege granted by the Board of Supervisors under a specific set of circumstances and conditions, and each application and situation is unique. Consequently, mere compliance with the generally applicable requirements may not be sufficient, and all additional measures, occasionally substantial, substantial, may be necessary to mitigate the impact of the proposed use. In some situations, no set of conditions would be sufficient to approve an application, even though the same request in another location would be approved. And I thought back to our recent appeal and thought, well, it'd be nice uh -huh. to have that language in our ordinance. Yeah. Well, that me. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think, I mean, that wraps it up, really. Uh, it's, it's on Gloucester County's, yeah, it's on Gloucester County's website. But if you stop by my office, I'll print one out for you. Which one is your office? Oh, the, the visitor center. center. Visitors, visitor center. Up, yeah. Upstairs, yeah. Hey, how are you? Um, yeah, it's really good. So that could be a preamble to... Well, it'd be in uh, 17047G is our like one sentence that tries to say that. And you could stick this right in. Change CUP to special exception slash special use permit and go on with it. And that's just, I'm sure others have something similar, but well, that struck me when I saw it today. If you look, if you look back at the Planning Commission's unanimous denial of the country in on Clark Lane, and then you look at the Board of Supervisors' unanimous denial of the country in on Clark Lane, we basically said that. Right. I mean, not as elegantly, but it's we said that. But we know we can be uh, tested in court, and every uh, landowner and applicant has the right to do that, uh, to make sure that uh, their uh, application was fairly considered. And, you know, this is not a a magic bullet or anything, uh, but it should set the expectation. And um, such a statements could be included on an application. Yeah, uh, you, know, you need to you know sign and acknowledge that you understand what this is. There's no expectation that you will or can get a permit for this part. I think setting expectations is the key point there, because I do feel sometimes like people come in with the, the false expectation that it's all fine because it's a big county with a lot of land and I'm not bothering anyone and we know that that is not the case in some parts of the county. That is helpful and I harking back to um, to what your some of the prior discussion here is um, I, I do think it I, I, again I like I like looking at this in terms of the event is it as opposed to necessarily the venue, um, because we've got, we have, a, you didn't even, even put down all the different kinds of potential venues that are in our ordinance, you know, civic clubs and blah, blah, I mean, That's we've true. got all kinds of stuff in here and even, even tourist homes and B&Bs and, you know, so um, I, I find it very confusing <laughs> when yeah. to try to read the ordinance and figure out what goes where um, in terms of events. Uh, but, but you know, the, the um, number of events per year, you know, whether it's just five is it, versus whether you can have them, mm -hmm. whether you've got a facility that only does them occasionally or whether you've got a facility dedicated to having events, as you say, a resort center or something or a conference uh, center. A banquet hall, right? I mean, that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, that the number of events and the size, obviously, uh, if the if the property is real big and it's set back and it has road frontage, that that makes it more more feasible to do those without impact on neighbors um, or on the community. But as you say, there are there are civic impacts such as fire and rescue. Um, but but yeah, I like that approach, um, and I think a comprehensive look through all all the uh, all the venues potential event venues that we have um, probably would be 
worth our time. And so that is the big distinction there is that most of these ordinances that I pulled in Gloucester is an exception in that it is, you know, I don't believe they've restricted where and what zoning districts you can have one of these things. Um, but most of these are pinned to a rural event sort of thing mm -hmm. because they recognize that there are other uses in a commercial zone that um, either as by right as part of that definition or as an assessor use to your legion hall is just and you can do it uh, in a commercial area but this is outside of a commercial area should you be able to do it and, and by and large that's what these examples represent Okay. And some, some for, I'm not sure it's for this sort of thing necessarily, but the, you can make a distinction for nonprofits. I don't know what the story is for churches, you know, what, how that's carved out separately, but, but you know, you can have a, a, a higher um, permitting fee for commercial activities and a lower one for nonprofits, for example, you know, as are as done in other circumstances if you want to make a distinction. But um, I don't know, I don't know about churches. Well, I think generally, again, speaking with the liberty, not being the zoning administrator, um, a church, a place of assembly, is likely going to have a realistic accessory use to have a, a event, you know, a harvest festival or a whatever kind of, you know, Wednesday night gathering. It's, it's likely an accessory use of that principal use. Well, like Graves Mountain Lodge also comes to mind. That is a that's, that's a serious that's event. That's a serious. Place, that's a different right? thing, and that's basically what Mr. Henry is saying. If you had a Graves Mountain Lodge directly off of a primary highway on a large acreage parcel, what would the impact be? And you have to ask yourself that. Now, if Graves Mountain Lodge is not off a of primary highway and is way back uh, where it is in Madison, you know, maybe the neighbors like it because they all work there. Or, uh, there are other reasons why it may or may not be good, but fire and rescue could be a bigger issue. And what do we want? What do our citizens want? Um, <clears throat> everything that we, uh, we, we've talked about uh, has dealt with facilities. Uh, I guess every county uh, has, seems like, a, a property that is is... is limited and proved that is used by the community for fairs, carnivals, uh, car shows, and, and, and things like this. Uh, every county around us, uh, and it's, it's a history of, of uses like this, but I don't think we really have a single property that kind of has that semi-public use. Yes, I think the def it's defined in many places, fairgrounds, mm -hmm. and of course some of our, uh, our or volunteer fire companies had fairgrounds. I mean, not not a, like Warren County, as Warren County owned right up from the regional jail, they had fairgrounds. That's pretty valuable property right now. I imagine they'll probably find a way that. Yeah. Uh, well, Madison, Madison, Madison County, County has it. Falkir County. At their big Pace park. County. Yeah, Hoover Park. Yeah. Yeah, every. every yeah, uh, and, you know, that's. They're bigger, it, richer counties than we are. Well, yeah, I don't know, about, I don't know if they're richer or bigger, but well, there are other things. You're talking about consolidation. But, but if, if there yeah. was a property in the county and, uh, that was accessible, yeah. would, it, would it be wrong to have a property like that designated as, as a, uh, a facility for people to go to? Yeah, I, I think ultimately that public hearing process would drive that. You're going to have a handful of people tell you that it's never, ever going to be a good idea, and you're going to have a whole group of people think that that's great, and then you know you and ultimately the Board of Supervisors have to wade through that and decide this is the best way to approach this, and it's reasonable to think that citizens in our community should have a place where they can gather. That could be, is there a way to work with the schools and do something, you know, like school property or something like that? I don't know. I mean, some counties, they have uh, private athletic fields. Well, and we kind of do, right? We have Stewart Field, which is leased to the Baseball Association. There's a lot of property down there, and those guys do an amazing job of keeping that up. Uh, now, it's, it's access is tough <laughs> at that site, um, but interesting. It's, but yeah, in, in, in another 30 years, maybe the uh, closed landfill could offer uh, recreation facility opportunities. But if somebody wanted to have a 20-acre parcel that 
it was all soccer fields. I mean, would that would that fall into this facility thing? Was another? Uh, there'd probably be a recreation facility. I don't recall off the top of my head what our ordinance says. I did see in other ordinances recreation facility. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you know that's a low intensity type of use and one that is easy to uh, to revert to something else if you need to. It's like you're to to move from soccer field to anything else is a pretty easy lift. Uh, so it's not a very invasive from that standpoint. And uh, like a solar field, which may be a solar field forever, uh, from what we heard the other day, because they just keep uh, refreshing their technology. Of course, as you said, we have school properties and you know. Well, a lot of communities further up in Northern Virginia really multi-use their school properties a lot better and more effectively. We do. I mean, the, the private soccer groups play on the, on the school fields, and um, there may be uh, ways we can more broadly use some of that property, but there are restrictions on when school is happening, which can and can't do, and security. The county still owns the... Uh, fields behind the elementary school. Hmm. Alex? Well, I just, when you're talking about the acreage, I just wonder what you're getting at there if we had acreage requirements. Like just, just parking uh, or? Well, park. It's, it's, it, I think ultimately it's acreage and buffer, and yeah. it's, uh, it, removes a lot of the not in my backyard concern. Correct, that's where I was uh, going. Whereas opposed to say uh, your property in Sperryville is general commercial. Somebody should expect that a commercial activity is going to happen there. People are going to congregate, it could be noisy, and it could be a lot of cars coming and going. But if you're in an ag area, I should have the expectation that a tractor is going to come and go. Right. Not a whole bunch of people. And so if there is going to be a whole bunch of people, then there should be some way to do it so that it's least intrusive on the community, but delivering that um, opportunity that the community wants. That's about it. Okay, Rick. So I think it's a great discussion. I think the um, conditional use permit is an interesting concept and probably should look at that pretty carefully. Yeah. Well, I mean, this language should just apply to our special exceptions. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. <clears throat> it, in Gloucester, just to be clear, they have special exceptions to go to the BCA and conditional use permits to go to the board. So, you know, you can call them anything yeah. you want. They're all special exceptions per the Code of Virginia. It's just who gets the board's allowed to reserve some onto themselves, and some people call them CUPs, some people call them SEs, some people call them SUPs. Tomato, tomato. Having thought about this, what, from a, a staff and drafting standpoint, how do we, so we know that on the sign front, um, this matrix approach, which seemed, came out of our last robust discussion on sign, seems something we can wrestle with from a practical standpoint. But here, um, do we need to make some choices on the front end to kind of direct drafting? Or? Uh, you know, the sign ordinance is so... Uh, bound in legal restriction, uh, that it's, it's a different animal from this, I view, um, as this is a, the Planning Commission and Board enabling opportunity in the community. Yeah, it's the uh, opposite. The Supreme Court's not going to get involved with this unless you're plainly violating some constitutional right. Yeah. Telling somebody that, uh, well, you know, this class of citizens is allowed to have an event facility, but that class is not. Um, you know, obviously we're not going to do that. So um, this is really, you know, what do you envision? If you can figure out what you envision is appropriate, then staff can help put words to frame that in. Okay. And I don't know how, you know, best to make that happen. Um, the planning commission could have selected a couple people to work on it uh, from amongst yourselves. Um, or you could just try to uh, identify some of those things that begin to frame in what you think might be appropriate for different types of scenarios, whether that be um, buildings, not buildings, or either or both, or uh, small numbers of people, lots of people, or any other different uh, ways you can slice it up into different types of uses. Well, 
Go ahead. Oh, so to visualize it, couldn't you have like a continuum of numbers of people and then intensity of use? Sure could, yeah. And then that could kind of go in the upper right would be the most. Yeah, so you could have a matrix of some sort that, uh, you know, you have 10 people and it'd be by right so, and you can do it yeah, anywhere. And uh, 10,000 people, you need to have 1,000 acres and uh, it's got to be 500 or, feet of or, uh, buffer. And you, Or if you're up here with not that many people but a huge activity. Right. So yeah, or or a, you know, a lot of people on a, a, lot of people on a huge I parcel. Mean, yeah. I, I don't want you to overcomplicate it, and yeah. pre bringing these different examples shows you that a lot of the localities have tackled this without getting that complicated because at the end of the day, that public hearing process is a great equalizer and allows you to tailor and kind of cut to fit your conditions to align with some use. So, so you just have to find that lowest common denominator that all facility, you know, event facilities that must go through a public hearing, you have to meet these. If you can identify those, then the public hearing process allows you to work on conditions. And if there's some group that wouldn't ever need to go through the public hearing, you can find some dividing line to define that. I think that would be helpful too. It may not exist. I don't, I don't know. And also just looking, as you say, through, and I mean, I assume without looking and knowing that you couldn't have a Grays Mountain Lodge by right and have the Hannah County would have to go through whatever, but um, it would probably be it'd be a conference center or a resort because they have lodging. But if we if you did what you've, you what you started here is kind of lay out all the stuff that we have, I think that kind of illuminates it uh, because you you know you're like well this is this is duplicative this is duplicative this yeah. is what, not what we had in mind and as you say if we if we have the um, discretion to keep some things in, not let go of some others, uh, that may be worth being part of the conversation as well. Yeah, you guys are driving the bus. Yeah, you? so one one thought I have is, I mean, I know that Mr. Goff has a ton of Commonwealth attorney responsibilities, and one thing I'd like to do is just talk to him, and if, if, he, is, if he is okay with it, um, at our next meeting, maybe we, we vote and approve to bring in um, some outside assistance, and and Art could Art could work hand in glove with them if he if if it would be helpful to him and to us, and help us with some drafting just to expedite things and move it along. Yeah, and and whoever you bring in, they have experience from yeah. many other localities that uh, sliced and diced it a little bit differently, and you have budget to do that. So. Right. Yeah. So that's one practical thing I'd like to address at our next meeting and then without burdening everyone here who's a volunteer but I think it'd be helpful and I will do it because I shouldn't ask if I'm not going to do it myself but along the lines of what Mr. Henry did on solar just come in with a one page or it could be bullet point it could be handwritten whatever and just say how you th how you think we should approach this and then we just share our ideas and then hopefully have Mr. Goff here and then and, and, then but, we and can I think set up like you said earlier identifying those uses and in the community that seemed to be working pretty well without bothering anybody. That's really most good. anybody. That's yeah. a that's a good list to make, and um, to make the other list is probably not a bad list to make either. And then try to draw from those. What what? Why are they binned in those two categories? What are those features that have caused them to be either um, nobody really knew they were doing that there to you get complaints every week? Yeah. Mm. Yep. It's not mandatory homework, but I think that would be a, I think it'd be a nice way to start, mm -hmm. and then we'll try to try to solve the practical problem of how we get it drafted, and we can vote on that at our next meeting. Um, but I, I'm grateful, uh, Mr. Curry, for you pulling all this together because it, it, I can go to Richmond tonight and stay up late and read all this. <laughs> well, uh, we're just grateful that we have the internet. I know it's an incredible <laughs> tool. It really is. Okay. All right. Well, I know this is sort of a, a thinking and talking meeting more than addressing anything, but it's also nice that we don't have a bunch of uh, special use permits for tourist homes to deal with like we normally do. So that's a refreshing change. Um, anything else from anyone? Yeah, I, I wonder if I can, if you'll indulge me for a minute. I um, I think at our last work session, uh, I we were discussing the renewable energy provision, and I'm not I'm not trying to bring that up onto the agenda, but I. 
I uh, saw and heard some things that uh, made me believe I um, was not clear in something that I said that I think is kind of important, which is that I want to make it clear for the record that I do believe um, that the recently enacted ordinance that we had is is fully passes legal muster. I, in my personal opinion, it does. And I, it, it was always my intent um, to make, in, in supporting that, to allow room for renewable energy projects um, as long as they were protective of the public safety and welfare and the goals and policies in our comprehensive plan. So I don't doubt we can make improvements, but I think the language passed by the board is reasonable in my opinion, given, given our unique tourism and other values uh, in the community. And um, I don't believe a court would consider it arbitrary and capricious, which I think is probably the standard that would mm -hmm. be supplied. Um, so I just want to make that clear. I, I don't in any event think it's exclusionary in my opinion. I know some might, might challenge that, but at least as I understand that term, because I think that term tends to apply more to um, housing situations where you're excluding certain income levels or races. But in any event, I, I think this, the enacted language even even though we were will work to improve it, um, is 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 consistent with the goals and policies in our recently passed comprehensive plan. So I just wanted to make that clear. I think that I, I was not clear about that, and I think it it might have led to some confusion. So well, I think that. the joint meeting we had was there was a lot going on there, a lot of moving parts, lots of people. So anyway, all right. Thank you for that. Any anyone else before we go? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thanks a lot.